I, I shall give you a few examples that will illustrate uh, why it is so important we get access to all the data and why what the drug industry publishes, even in your drug medicine, should be viewed as advertisements and nothing else. Uh, here is a very infamous example. GlaxoSmithKline had conducted several trials in children and adolescents of their antidepressant drug, and they hadn't published a single one of them because it didn't work. Now they did an additional trial where uh, they actually did publish it, and uh, the, the main author said that paroxetine is generally well tolerated and effective for major depression in adolescents. It became one of the most cited papers of all, and the sales force were told that there was remarkable uh, efficacy and safety. In truth, there was a remarkable absence of efficacy and safety, as you will see shortly. Documents obtained during litigation reveal that this study was negative for all eight protocol specified outcomes, and it was positive for harm. <coughs> The paper was ghostwritten, so it got the right messages, but it had 22 authors. Now, uh, originally Glaxo had planned to do an extensive media relations surrounding this study until they viewed the results and realized it didn't work. That is not something we want to publicize. That was their first reaction, but that changed. Uh, and here you can see what the Americans say, torture your data until they confess. Um, I will give some examples. The p-value was not significant for any of these protocols specified outcomes. Change in Hamilton depression total score, p-value of 13%. Then you play around with some cutoff levels until the data confess that those that came down below eight in this score, you got a significant difference. This is scientific misconduct. Uh, and they did that with several other variables and they played around with the data a lot because compared to the protocol, there were at least 19 additional outcomes that they tested and then they could choose cutoffs and whatever they might wish to do. Now, uh, the first author said that depression-related variables were declared a priori. This wasn't true. No document prior to eight months after they had broken the code mentions, for example, one of these outcome measures that suddenly appeared in the manuscript but didn't show off in the protocol. And the term primary outcome they replaced by something they call depression-related outcome because when you change the primary outcome into a secondary one or invent a new primary outcome from a secondary one and calls it a primary outcome, then it's a, what, what some people call the Texas sharpshooter technique, that you fire a pistol towards the wall and you don't hit the target, but then you remove the target and make a new one with the ball in the center. Wow. Uh, we showed it worked after all. Now, here it becomes very bad because uh, there were 11 serious adverse effects on paroxetine versus two on placebo. This is statistically significant. Five of these children became suicidal, but this was uh, relabeled as an emotional liability, like uh, my two teenage daughters, they uh, show this every day, I should tell you. <laughs> Three additional cases of suicidal ideation or self-harm were now called admission to hospital, but they didn't explain why. Early drafts of the paper prepared for JAMA, there was not a single serious adverse event at all in this manuscript. Later drafts then came something, on the table, but when it was published, there was only one headache in one patient that was considered by the treating investigator to be related to paroxetine treatment. And I believe whether it was not, a, what was it, a biochemist in, the, in Glaxo who uh, appeared here as the treating investigators because the investigators just received the final paper. So, I mean, what have they done? 
What the unpublished study report really showed was that there were eight versus one who became suicidal, and this is statistically significant, but the doctors didn't know about it, and this drug that doesn't work became very popular in the States. Now, uh, Glaxo had decided not to publish these trials, as I already uh, told you, but there was also a memo from the Central Medical Affairs team that said it would be commercially unacceptable to include a statement that efficacy had not been demonstrated, as this would undermine the profile of paroxetine. Uh, I have a few other examples. Uh, a, a drug from AstraZeneca, an anti-psychotic uh, drug, was presented at a congress and press release, meta-analysis of four trials. There you have it. You were Kaiserized, Tom. Meta-analysis of four trials. Are you then AstraZenecaized? Ketiapine is significantly better than the old cheap drug haloperidol. That wasn't true. Ketiapine was actually weaker than haloperidol when you saw the files. Negative trials were called Beric trials in internal emails, and trial showing haloperidol was best, was published, and then it showed that Astra's drug was best. That's magic. Um, and then they had a speaker slide kid. Long-term seroquel has neutral effect on weight. weight. Weight neutral at all doses. It's not true, of course. A journal publication concluded that based on data from clinical trials with schizophrenia, this drug had neutral effect on weight. But internal documents revealed that that uh, patients with a weight gain of more than 7%, which is very much actually, in all trials was 18%. That's what they call no effect on weight. And in placebo-controlled trials, the relative risk of clinically significant weight gain was 2.5. So this is to give you a little flavor for what happens behind the curtains. And here is my last example. That's uh, riboxetine. It's registered in Europe, but it doesn't work. The German uh, Agency for Health Technology Assessment got hold of the unpublished trials, and then you can see there was one published trial against placebo which showed a large effect on remissions. Then there were six unpublished trials that didn't show anything, and so on. So I think you will now understand why we need access to unpublished data. It's of crucial importance for public health. And I will uh, tell you a few other things because we have now access to clinical study reports of SSRI drugs from the EMA that we look at, and it takes us years. It's absolutely terrible. Only three drugs uh, in Sweden, they take up the clinical documentation, 70 meters of paper. So we have told our Swedish colleague we can't do that. It will kill us. So we work on a pilot project, which we have done for a whole year, and we analyze all the data uh, on one of the drugs. I won't tell you which one it is, because then that company will get very nervous. Um, and I'll tell you some other things. Uh, this marketing from the industry is tremendously harmful. They have made the psychiatrist believe that when you stop one of these drugs, the depression comes back, and therefore you need to get on the drug again. So they, they, they are now treated for many years. Many, many years. The sales in Denmark is so large of the SSRI so that 7% of the whole population can be treated every day from they are born till they die. 7%. It's absolutely crazy. And this is marketing. It's not true that the depression comes back because people get bad already after one or two days. And if you give these drugs to people who are not depressed, they also get bad when they try to stop. This is dependency, just like the benzodiazepines. But it has been hidden, and the psychiatrists believe in it. And I tell them, then why, if you give these drugs even to healthy volunteers, why do you see these effects? They are not sick. David Healy in Wales has uh, done a trial in healthy volunteers. And to his big surprise, two of them became suicidal. One of them almost killed herself when the telephone rang and saved her. Two out of 24 people only became suicidal. We have now access to 
some healthy volunteer studies from the EMA. We are very grateful for that because the drug industry really has never wanted these to become public knowledge. These drugs are very dangerous and uh, it's incredible what happens and that these poor patients should now be treated for the rest of their lives. When I studied medicine, we said a depression lasted three months, perhaps six months, not for 40 years. It's the benzodiazepine scandal once again. And the uh, abstinence symptoms are very much the same. We have published that uh, a year ago, I think, uh, at the Nordic Cochrane Center. So it's very, very, very scary. Uh, these were some remarks about psychiatry. And uh, I have a, a little more to say without slides. Namely, um, you know about Biox, that is estimated to have killed about 30,000 people who never needed the drug in the first place because of cardiovascular um, adverse events. Merck hit cases of myocardial infarction. There was this famous Viber trial, and where was it published? In New England Journal of Medicine, which is a favorite journal by drug companies. Three cases of myocardial infarction had been deleted. Um, almost one million reprints was bought by Merck. And uh, so they, they, this journal has an enormous conflict of interest. When the FDA had warned Merck that they needed to tell the doctors about this trial, that there was actually an increase in myocardial infarctions, which the company tried to see, oh no, that's only because the comparator drug is uh, somehow beneficial. What difference does that make to the patients? I would like to take the comparator drug then, if there were fewer uh, cardiovascular events. It's rubbish. But nevertheless, Merck was told to tell American doctors about this trial. The very next day, they told their 3,000 strong sales force in the United States, don't talk about this trial. Then they gave them a pamphlet that stated that the risk of myocardial infarction and other things was one eighth, eighth, one eighth of those of other drugs. It was a fat lie. It was increased, and they said it was one eighth. It's just unbelievable. Uh, Pfizer then went to the FDA here in 2005, and they claimed that now they had analyzed 40,000 patients in their trials, and there were not any increase in risk on Pfizer's drug Silicoxib, Celebrex, or whatever the name is. This was wrong, and Pfizer knew it was wrong. Aren't you lying when you know something is wrong and you tell the FDA, no, 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 no risk on our drug? In Denmark, uh, a few days after Merck had withdrawn its uh, drug from the market, Pfizer Denmark wrote to all Danish doctors, oh, our, our drug is so good, based on 400,000 patients, that was a typo, it should have been 40,000, but never, never mind. Uh, uh, they were taken to task by the Danish medicines agency that told them, you can't say this because it's not true. It's, do you know how big the fine was? $2,000. $2,000. That's what we do in Europe. We must do it better, like the Americans. Give them. That's what we need to do. Now, uh, the story just goes on and goes on on uh, other drugs as well. Rossi Glissatron is one of the newest uh, scandals. There were great concerns about the drug before it was approved, and the EMA luckily asked uh, the company Glaxo again to do a big trial post-marketing. But the problem with a big trial post-marketing is that when it's over, it's also about the patent being over, and they have earned all the money and created an immense amount of harm, which they did in this case, so it's too late. Our, I mean, our regulatory agencies need to ask for this documentation before they decide whether a drug should come on the market. And it's the same story again, that it increased cardiovascular uh, incidence, and again, Glaxo manipulated terribly with the data, when an FDA scientist got hold of the original case report forms, which was an immense task for him, he found out that adjudication of adverse events favored rosiglitazon over the comparator four to one. It was tremendously flawed, 
what Glaxo published both in the New England Journal and in the Lancet. So again, as Tom has taught me, it's only advertisements, it's not science, what the drug companies are publishing in New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so, uh, I think I have been rather quick because uh, I'm actually ahead of time, but that's nice, we can have a long discussion afterwards. So I will just finish by saying I wrote a long, long paper in trials, in the journal called Trials. It's up on our website, there's free access, I favor that, so I have to pay to get it published. Uh, I wrote it on behalf of a European politician in the EU, and it became very long, but it was a fascinating experience for me because I discovered that the European Commission, the OECD, the National Institutes of Health, you name it, almost everybody, they favored that we sh should share our data. But what they all forgot was, also when the industry has made the trials, of course, that's where we need to share our data the most. So that's what I'm arguing. Thank you.